you know, well, what do you, I mean, when you're doing your production time and you guys are working on your new album, I mean, are you sticking with hardware or are you using a combination of both? We use a combination of both. Okay, so. Um, we use a com combination of both, like I said, because it's infinite possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, the, I still, we still, one of the things is, especially when you want, we want to do filter sweeps and rides yeah. and all that. Yeah. I, that mouse ain't working. No, 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 no. I can't push that shit across the table. Yeah. So, MIDI Learn, as I said earlier, MIDI Learn is my best thing right now. Yeah. So I can just, you know, hit the MIDI Learn, hit a, hit a controller. Oh. What's up, people? Put me on a hot seat right here on the end. I gotta go first. Uh oh. How you all doing out there? Well, um, like Junior said, it was a long night last night, but we're all here, so uh, let's just get this thing going. All right, so um, I got obviously you see everybody who's up here. We're just going to talk about like some uh, uh, times when music was inspirational to you, like uh, um, you know, since you already got the mic. Um, oh, you want me to start with that? You put me on the hot seat again. Yeah, I'm gonna put you on the hot seat again. This is how well, we start. It's uh, um, I mean, I'll be honest. Um, I even know the date, May 14th, 1978. It's the first time I went and started buying records. It's going to be 30 years of just buying records nonstop. Uh, the last 30 years and. Um, a lot's happened, and we're here, and um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, let's talk about, you know, just uh, um, some strange times. Like, what made you, like, what inspired you in the first place to ever throw a storm wave? Well, going to England in 1989, just seeing, like, you know, 25,000 people in a field dancing to, you know, pretty much at the time, our music, it was all American music. And, you know, hearing stuff from Detroit, Chicago, New York, and seeing 25,000 people dancing to it, I can't explain what that was like, because it was the most, it was like the best thing that could happen to anybody to see in another country, all these people just grooving off of American music. It was incredible, really. I mean, changed my life, so. But um, being part of that, I just wanted to come back to New York and, you know, basically break it in America and um, it took a while but you know little by little we built it up and um, about a year and a half you know 5,000 people in an abandoned warehouse that was also a really great feeling just to know you could draw that many people and um, I don't know I just to me it's always been DJ it's always been like I just want to play records and since I'm in you know junior high school and um, still doing that till you know to today pretty much loving it it's uh, uh, what inspired you to like start like Sonic Groove Records? Was it just because you well, I mean, more records? when when um, we started bringing the scene in, we wanted to bring the records too, and because we, we knew you know that Chicago, Detroit, you know, were making records. You couldn't buy those records in New York City. Everything in New York was you know mostly um, deep house and you know more commercial stuff. We wanted to bring in more underground stuff that we were playing, and then. When the Europeans got into it in 1990, um, you know, like R&S records and all that, um, it was just a whole new wave of music coming in from overseas to America, and just to be in it at that time, I mean, that, and wow, there was so many great artists coming out, and being able to get those records to the people that wanted to buy them in America too, and you know, we wanted to start a scene, we didn't want to be like, um, you know, just a lot of DJs then wanted the records to themselves, they would like cross the labels out, we didn't want that. We wanted to get 30, 40 copies and give whoever wanted to have the record so they could play it too and we'd be up on the next record, you know? And um, I, I just, I, I like records. So, I mean, having a store is having records. So, I mean, basically that's why I did it. Just so I could get my hands on the record and stuff. I figured it was some kind of record junkie thing. Yeah, pretty bad actually. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, your brother always tells me this story about how like, I don't know, you gave Joey this, Joey Beltram some kind of whatever. Um, you turned it like Energy Flash is partially inspired by an experience you shared with him or something? Um, well, when we were doing like records on New Groove, Joey did a couple records and then um, he, um, I came back from Europe and started telling everybody about these parties. And um, basically, me and Joey went and did a record for New Groove and then after that, um, just the people that were around in 1990, it's a long time ago now, it's 18 years, but you had Mondo Music, you had um, How and Little on New Groove, and um, everybody was making these underground tracks that were really like, 
you know, just something that they were like freestyle, but they were kind of matched up with house, and you had like deep house mixed in, everything was thrown together, samples, and um, just um, feeling the vibe of being in the studio, like, you know, like we had a studio up in Manhattan on 38th Street on Northcott, um, Tommy Musto. Bobby Condors would come in and do like a track and like me and Lenny would come in after he's finishing up doing the poem we're going in and do a track and we're just vibing off of what we're hearing them doing and everybody was just really in tune with each other at the time. And, right, um, were you using sequences or what, uh, were you laying stuff Well, I, like you were talking before like about like the 8-track the task cam, the 38, we used to strike tape and then like take whatever we were using and record it, layer it one by one on each track until you had, you know, a basis of a track on those 8 tracks and then using like, um, you know, a cheap rolling sequence, uh, like um, SBX-80 or one of those, and it was very rude of, you know, very fundamentally, like, the very beginning of, like, MIDI, I didn't understand it at all at the time, to be honest with you. <laughs> I was just a guy, I was like, let's throw this sample here, I'll play this keyboard line there, and, but, um, you know, learning the stuff with everybody, uh, going along the way, like Lenny, Lenny D, Tommy Musto, um, it was just like, we were like a work machine. We come in at 12 in the afternoon, we stayed at 12 at night every day of the week until we, you know, had a whole bunch of tracks out. Sometimes you finish records in that period of time too. You get in the studio at midnight and by eight o'clock in the morning, you started from scratch and had to record mix. Well, we had, know, a, we had 10, a, 12 hours. We later. had a pressing plant too, like a Pexton was like the yeah. pressing plant. So we have the thing done and we just go right to a Pexton and they press them right up. So and you get acetates and you, uh, which are lacquer and they would press a test pressing and you'd take it out to the DJs and it would last about 10 plays until it was, the grooves wound it down. But you'd, you'd do a record in a couple of hours and then the next day it was, you know, at your favorite DJ playing in the club and stuff like that. And this is before computers, I mean, my stuff was before computers and before MIDI. You had to lay stuff in by hand or stop start drum machines to try to get things to sync. So, you know, it's come a long way. It's <laughs> funny that you say that because we was just talking in the back about the same thing. You know, you guys kind of like created a whole industry i mean you got it was like it's like you just wasn't a dj yeah i mean we used to have to load the car up after pexton like when i did bones breaks and we load them in the car we'd go to rocket soul we'd go to like uh, you know vinyl mania all the stores uh downtown records drop off thousands of records on a friday and you know next week they'd order a whole bunch more you get rid of five thousand another week to get a few more thousand and by the time you're done, twenty thousand records independently out of you know out of the trunk of the car, and it was. But that was not, Those numbers were nothing in those days. Now it's these numbers are big numbers. Yeah. But in those days, you do a hundred thousand records on singles, and it'd be nothing. You know, you could actually do millions of records as an independent you know producer if you got into the right kind of stream. If your stuff got you know licensed overseas. Now it's a lot different as far as what people sell, you know. Yeah, I mean, in those times, I mean, it was like if I made the record, they'd make me have to you know go bring them to the record store. I had to be the guy loading the car up too. I had to put the shrink wrap on the things. It was like really a process there. But um, man, it was great times. I mean, nowadays, if you could sell a thousand records on vinyl, you that would be a hit these days with the way digital is. So. Yeah, you look at a lot of the things and they're selling 200,000 copies and it's a big deal. I, I sold two and a half million, you know what I mean? By now, it's like a crazy number. But in those days, that was small. People do 40, 50 million records, the big, you know, the big artists and stuff like that, so. Yeah, but you're also talking about a time when there wasn't many artists competing for the same dollar. That's true. If you would. That's and true. It's also another time when people bought vinyl records. It's like the people who buy vinyl records now are committed specialists that are keeping something that the rest of the industry, whatever, very confused industry, um, no real point in discussing that, but it's a, uh, um, you know, the, people aren't like, and you have to be a specialized nerd with a thousand dollars of equipment to even be buying records. <laughs> I'm a gear whore. <laughs> but hey, we, yeah, we, like, we, you know what? Some of those like old Detroit records with the original labels, like retroactive stuff. I mean, you know, when you get your hands on a copy or something like that, it's like, you know, it's timeless and it's like something that, you know, it's precious to me when I look at it and I'm just like, wow, you know, I remember this from that time. You really can't do that with digital with a file. You can't. You know, I like having a record collection. I like the way it looks. I don't care if my house is full of records all over the place in the sink and you know, next to the garbage. There's just whatever. There's records everywhere. It's like kind of like you know, gives me strength in a way. Frankie, did you become a a, a DJ and go into producing, or you? Pro well, here, this is what happened. All right, this is how this happened. I turned 18 and I got a residency in Long Island and the drinking age was only 18 and my birthday is October 16th. On December 1st, 
they raised their drinking age to 21. So I DJed for five weeks and I got fired and I had to wait another three years. So, like Omar Santana was like my partner at the time, you know, you know, and he was doing a lot of stuff with editing and I got into that and then we started, you know, trying to write songs and it took about a year or two, but we got a couple of things going and, um, yeah, I, de I basically started producing to get jobs to, you know, DJ and it, did, it took a while, but it happened. It took about three or four years. So we should probably introduce everybody, just in case you guys don't all know who everybody is here. Um, so obviously, Frankie Bones. And right next to him we have uh, Cornelius Harris. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Let them know what you're uh, here for. Uh, Cornelius Harris, and I'm uh, with Underground Resistance. I'm the label manager for UR. I also have my own uh, management company, Alter Ego, and I manage Juan Atkins and Model 500 and a lot of other folks like that. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Hank Shockley, and I, I don't even know what I do, but I have a company called Shockley Entertainment, and we just getting ready to put out the Bomb Squad with me and Keith, and uh, whatever, man. I'm just here to just try to enlighten you guys on something that happened back in the days. Maybe we can open you up and get some nice, good wisdom and stuff from us. Colonel Craig, Plan to be Communications. <laughs> <laughs> He was up for a Grammy this year. Yeah. Jesse Saunders, I, I, I feel kind of boxed in here with all these New York guys. I'm from Chicago. <laughs> so good, but Chicago is nothing but little New York, man. Come on, man. Man, you know what it was? It's like in the discussion in there, it's like all this New York stuff. I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> I just felt like, oh, you know, I'm getting knocked out punches. I'm Mayor Parrish. I've been doing stuff since the mid-70s, 80, 100 records or so under different names and things like that. Were you really a male stripper? Nah, yeah, yeah, no. That was, that was an accident. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Not me being a male stripper. That was intentional. <laughs> and uh, I came from before MIDI, before computers and stuff like that. You know, and uh, I'm still saying that. <laughs> um, Jimmy Sanchez. Um, yeah. Not, Matt, you know, it's, I feel really privileged to be sitting here amongst like all these cats like influenced me, you know, and I'm probably the baby of the bunch, but I was lucky enough to get into it, you know, when uh, <clears throat> when it was a lot of, you know, everything was still relevant. I mean, there were still labels and, sh you know, shit was popping. Um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, in a nutshell, um, I'm privileged and thank you. So, yeah. For that. You know, something, we was talking something I thought was really interesting. We was talking in the back about, you know, the fact that, you know, when the, when, you know, the 12 inch vinyl, as everybody know it today, you, you know, it came about because it was a promo thing where, they, you know, you know, somebody at some label decided I'm just going to take incredible new sounds and it was minimal. Yeah, well, what we did was, again, it, it started from the fact that all of these 12 inch that we had didn't have drum breaks or anything to mix in and out of. So we just, I took a drum machine and I'd bring it to the club and make my own intro and mix stuff on top of it. And then like when Planet Rock came out, man, I used to ride everything. I would ride it under the whole set just to give it a whole four on the floor, hard hitting type of beat because, you know, I mean, we've got all these, these you know, the technology and speakers now, but back in those days, they were big old, huge wooden cabinets. They were like seven walk footers. Yeah, you could walk in, literally walk into them, but we put them in rooms about this big. So you'd really feel, you know, the bottom, and the more I could tweak it, and the, the bigger I could make that 808 kick drum or whatever, you know, you just, you feel in the bass. But that was how that whole thing started. It was like I was making tracks just to mix in and out of, and you know, I'm playing at a club that, where we get 1,500 kids a week, so, there was one record store in town called Imports, etc. that would get all of this stuff in. It was like the only place you could get it at the time, right? So I would go in there. They also had a record pool <laughs> that I was a part of as well. And the one guy in there would always ask me what I was playing that all these people are coming in here requesting. And I had no idea what it was, you know? So I said, okay, I'll make a, a cassette <laughs> back then. And they played it in the store and people picked it out. It happened to be those tracks, which later became on and on. And I actually took that straight off of the drum machine. I didn't record it or anything. We just ran it right into the lake. Ran it right into the lake, and we just put it out and promoted it the same way we did the party, man. Like you were talking about how you could how you could sell hundreds of thousands of copies of that record. We put that record out, and in like a couple of weeks, we had done over twenty thousand units on that. And I'm talking like out of my basement in my car. Got all my friends for distribution. I had my girlfriend answering the phones as a secretary. My cousin was a head of promotion. I mean, we, you know. <laughs> 
We ran out of the basement. And, and, and you know something, you, you also got to understand too that back in the days, everything was localized. Yep. You know, it, you know, we didn't know there was no such thing as national. You know, we we nowadays everybody. Yeah, I, well, there was a reason. I thought we were in our city limits, like inside New York, and that was it. The main eleven. But there was also a reason for it because to get a record started on the East Coast and then get started on the West Coast, you had to go out to the West Coast. Your record would die on the East Coast and come up on the West Coast, so you're losing your record here. Then you wanted to go down to Miami, and then you're losing New York and. LA, so if you didn't have a lot of money, like a major label, Atlantic had a dance division, you couldn't push your stuff up the charts. So you well, stayed local and you grew your record locally. Well, basically, you had to be a pop record. You had to be a you pop know, record. You know, well, I tell you, the first place I went to was Detroit. Okay. Right? Detroit was a four hour drive for me. And they showed love. Clifford Byright yeah. gave me a call, said, hey, I heard your record's blowing up there. Come on up here. Let me get some in the store. Next thing I know, they had a TV show called The Scene. I was on that. I was on JLB. I was on GPI. So I was in Detroit. Yeah, you gotta look that up on YouTube. They have yes. the videos. They're incredible. Yeah, I know. They really told me. Nice. I was over there with Kim J. Yeah. He told me there's a video. You guys should also talk about remix services, play things like Disconnect and stuff like that that took the 12 inch and they would sit with a razor blade and they would edit this stuff, you know, and in a day or two they would turn around records and record labels would turn to these companies because they didn't have in-house production and they would say, here's our record, here's a couple of outtakes, try to do something with it. And it was all done with the razor blades and stutter edits and things like that. So that was a whole trip in itself and as a DJ you'd, you'd get a subscription to these services and every month you would get one or two pieces of vinyl with exclusive mixes that nobody else had. The record labels went to these companies and then that was distributed out to the DJs, which is different than a kind of a record pool. I think some of the disconnect things wound up later on in the record pool, but if you, some of these, um, these companies are kind of expensive. If you were a DJ, it was like $50 a month back then and that was a lot of money. So a lot of people couldn't get to these good remixes, you know. You had to be a good DJ making a lot of money to be able to just have the privilege to have some of these remixes and stuff. Oh, by the way, uh, back, in, back in those days, you know, one of the things, I, I've been involved on both sides of it, but back in those days, if you made like $25 for the night, you know, that was good. a good night, good. okay? Right. And you didn't play for an hour or two, you played for eight, nine, good. ten hours. Yeah. So that's what trips me out these days when people are like, oh yeah, he's playing like this two long set tonight, set. like it's a big miracle, it's like, dude, for two hours. every night you play a two-hour <laughs> set. That was every night you got to play. I remember a band would do like 12-hour sets right. and stuff, it's like, you know. It was yeah. crazy. But uh, I, I want to ask a question real quick to the audience. Uh, I know this is about electronic music history here. How many of you are familiar with the history at all? Okay, now I want to ask a real, real personal question. How many of you have, have read my book? <laughs> okay, well basically, the reason why I say that is because a lot of this history that we're talking about here I start off probably the first four or five chapters is nothing but the history, how I, how I got influenced with it, where it came from, why I went a certain direction, why I made a record, and so on and so forth. Because for me, it's really, it was really more a labor of love as opposed to something that I was trying to do or make something happen. And to this day, when people ask me questions about, you know, how do I feel about it or what was it like, I'm like, dude, I'm still that little kid in, in downstairs in my basement with my little, you know, sequencer programming beats. I wasn't thinking about the rest of the world, you know, and it's like as long as you can keep that love. Yeah, we, that we weren't making records to sell records. A lot of us were just making records because we were just to make doing records. it and the record <laughs> happened afterwards, you know what I mean? And, and you have... And you, no, no, you are saying you had to make a hot record in order to make another record. Exactly. Because it wasn't like you was guaranteed, like now the cats is guaranteed another record. Like what the fuck is that? You know, we just made one record and if you... You got a single with the option of another option, single, yeah. maybe the option of a third, right. and if those three did really well, maybe the option of an album, you know, if you were lucky. So you guys have it good now because, I mean, you can start your own label and put out as many things as you want to. You can go direct to, you know, Beatport and all of these other places. We couldn't do that back Back in the day, you had to call up a record store and ask if they wanted to take your record, because they didn't have to take it. Or if you, you know, put stuff out, the distributor was, would sometimes block you. You'd send it to a distributor, and the distributor said, I don't, I don't like this record, so you're not going to make it to the stores. So you didn't even get that to that point. You know, you did a record, the distributor said, I'm not touching this. Then you, you couldn't screwed. get on the radio either, yeah. or a mix show, unless you had a record in the store. So it was well, only catch-22 for you to even get a record out. It's a miracle that any of us actually ever got it. here. Go no, Bill, I was just going to say, I mean, one of the things about that, though, is that... Yeah, I get yeah, yeah, working right, yeah. One of the things about it, though, is that uh, people worked harder. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, everybody up here, I think, you know, and, and nothing against you know, anybody coming up, but the thing is, uh, there were so many obstacles there 
you knew your stuff had to be hot. Well, you lived it 24 just, hours. It wasn't right. you did when you got home from work. But, right. You don't just do a track and then just assume that automatically because I've done this, I'm going to throw it on B-port and I'm going to be successful and whatever else. I mean, not that happens now, but people, I think, had a better understanding of the amount of work that it took and the fact there were no guarantees and there was, there was nothing that you could lean on and say, okay, I know I've got this waiting for me like this. But I'm going to play devil advocate against that for one second. It's because I think it's harder now. Because I think that one of the things that, that we've all had, and you know, and you guys can probably you know contest this, is that you know we were more it was we were we had less things going on, so we were more focused. All right, I think that one of the problems that now is that there's so many things happening, there's so many choices that it just numbs you. It's like it's like it's like you're walking into a fucking store and you're starving, and you see everything that you love. So you end up like, mm. yeah, trying to make a choice and you don't yeah. get to pick. See, but I think, I think that's also kind of good because if you have a unique ex expression, you're doing ambient dance music or something, you have an outlet for that. Whereas in the past, if you didn't do what the market had, right. You didn't. You didn't get. Yeah, but you have an outlet. But the difference is the difference is the is the audience participation level. See, the, the one thing that that we had was that the audience was just as active as as the as because the, there weren't the a lot of choices. You went to the club and you heard dance music, or you went and li listened to house music. Uh, now there's so much variety. You can. There are a lot of niches. But there's also, you have a lot of choices. Well, so something that's good is going to come out. And the audience has heard everything, man. They're fucking numb, man. We'll see you in a second. Well, you know, it, not only is the audience... They're looking at, they're looking at numb, these days now. But the context is gone. You guys talk about growing up in New York and seeing this wild oh, stuff in the 70s. Say and like, nah, <laughs> but, the, you know, what, what I notice now, being, you know, a cat that does go to the blogs and, and the, you know, I live on a computer every day, is that there's massive amount of quantity, but there's no quality today. I mean, right. I'll be honest. Exactly. Yeah. And the difference from when I was growing up and yeah. going, you know, going to you know Sonic Groove or like you know actually going to Storm Raves and being that kid that would sit down at at, at Strictly Rhythms offices waiting for Gladys or anyone to come out and give me one record. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would do all day, just sit there, wait, see everybody walk in. I'm like, yo, I out there. Oh my God! I'm like I, that's that, that's me. I, I grew up where there was was record booths. I used to go to Florida Record, but I you know I was like this is kind of whack. I don't want to like do this and like this is you know I just want to go. So I would go to Emotive. I would go to New Group. I would go. I would get out of my school bus, hop on a train, go to New York, and just yo yeah, you can hit all the labels on one train. day and go to every you know, single every label day, and, yeah. and and pick up the best music in the planet. And, and we don't have that today. The thing is, there's mad kids making music. I mean, everywhere. There's kids, at, like right now, uploading some shit, uh, you know, on You Send It, and Z, uh, Z Share, and, or they got their little blog, and they're popping some stuff. But there's so much quantity, man. Okay. But there's no quality. That's well, sad. I'm going to ask you, Junior, what, what's, what's, what's good and what's whack? I don't know the difference, man. Oh, well, I, I know, know the difference. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think a good record. No, I mean, you gotta listen to a lot. I, I, I think dude. a good record no, what's is. A good, what's a good record? You gotta record, really yeah, listen. Yeah. Like, if you went on, like, Juno UK just to listen to new titles, you gotta listen to 100, 150 things before you find that gem. And I mean, it takes hours. It doesn't, you know, yeah, and sitting on a computer doing it, it's like, I sit there, like, to get my hottest record I'm gonna play out here, it took me eight hours to find it. It's like a needle in a haystack. But I think as a DJ today, that's your job. I mean, I yeah, DJ too, and I have to say, a couple of hours of time each week to go find new music and there's shit and there is good stuff I think good records you know if you know where to look or if you have any kind of taste in the new re good records surface and you know, they come up you know that there's some solution. records that I play that I hear in other clubs and I know it's good because it's other DJs have found it just like I did I have a solution to that problem <laughs> What's your solution? I am the best a and R person yeah. in the world all right I only put out quality shit on my label, so go check out my releases <laughs> on my label. <laughs> Seriously, because my thing is this. When I play out, I, I have a mess. I'm bringing a message. I'm not, you know, this, this, I had this discussion at about 4 o'clock in the morning, like with these kids out on Washington last night. And they tried to tell me about how, you know, stripping stuff down and making it as minimal as possible is like, the most pure essence of the art form. And I'm like, dude, my first tracks were minimal. You can't tell me what minimal is all about, right? But my thing was this, it's like, 
the demise of the record business has come in stripping everything down. And the reason why I say that is because now we have nothing to latch on to. There's nothing to like, and now you say, everybody and their mama's making a track? Well, if there's 100,000 tracks out there and they all sound the same, hell, you're only going to sell one or two copies of it. Right. My thing is like, I yeah, miss, the, I miss the, the whole I think, I think artist Driven. But we'll also not boxed I mean? into what used to be the norm because in those days, if you didn't have a four on the four kick drum with a conga beat in the background and an 808 or whatever, your record wasn't considered worthy at all. Now there's so much variation that you have a little bit more creative. You could put that that um, share vocal on there or that a vocoder on a mainstream track when you couldn't get away with that stuff before. So I kind of like that there's all this variety because there's more. As a creative guy, me, I have all these possibilities. I want to put a whacked out drum loop, which I which I wouldn't be able to do. Years ago, I, want, I wanted something to have a little drum and bass 16 bar in there. People would say, what, what, what did you do? You destroyed it. Now I have that. That's the way to go because everything pretty much has been done with, you know, but there's still more areas to be explored. And, you know, you got to know what's out there, who's doing what, and put all different sounds that, you know, if jungle doesn't belong or breaks don't belong in a house track, I mean, I used to always put loops over my house beats. Just try to do something a little different so you don't sound like everybody else. Even if, you know, I never thought my stuff was good, but people bought it, and after, you know, years of listening back, I'm like, that was crap, man. I still think it's crap, but... <laughs> <laughs> Not all of it, but, you know, a lot of it, you know? And, I mean, it's just like, to me, I always try to be different. I'm, I, you know, I'm a freak anyway, but, I mean, just try to not be, like, the next guy who's doing the same thing I'm doing. I would say there is no future for electronic music. There's just a future for music. And uh, don't get caught up on the, the names and the, the, the titles and the genres and all that. Focus on the music. Uh, you know, I just want to you know, say I think that's, that's the future of it. The future is in, in music and people you know, who are willing to actually put their heart and soul into it. And, uh, and again, you know, keep in mind, and I, and I just want to say every single person on this panel uh, I've had some kind of uh, tangential connection with and been inspired by. Uh, you know, this guy sold tons of our records. Uh, you are as often called the public enemy of techno. I mean, we, <laughs> we yeah. love these guys. I sold tons of the, the record when I was working at the record shops. This guy right here, Carl, uh, I can't even, I don't even have words for this guy. He, uh, he, uh, he used to live in the same loft or same set of lofts with this guy, and, uh, and I got to hear some great things this guy was doing. Uh, he's always been, uh, want to do his own thing and it's been an inspiration. Uh, you know, Brendan here has done a ton of stuff. Jesse, you know, <coughs> Parrish, you know, and Junior down there. I mean, all you guys. And that's the thing. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a collective thing. It's not one thing. It's not one person. It never is. Uh, sometimes, again, you get lost in things. <laughs> and, and, and I see my man DJ Mallow from DMZ UK is in the house. And, and you should definitely come down and see what the future is all about. It's called Destruction Saturday. It's poolside. Bomb Squad, DJ Malice, Scream, Joe Nice. It's gonna be crazy. So you're gonna go to the next <coughs> season, to the future. <coughs> hey, I'm mad because you said what I was just gonna say. No. <laughs> Basically, say what say I get. Uh, say it again. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, my perspective on it, coming from someone who has been, I've been a record music enthusiast since I was about four or five years old. I was collecting records from my aunt and my mother and listening to everything from Minnie Ripperton to the Jazz Crusaders and James Brown and all the rest of the stuff, which is really cool, Hank, when y'all started using that stuff, because I was like, oh, I wanted to do that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's just the love of music. If you love music, that's the future. I mean, whether it's electronic, whether it's acoustic, whatever it may be, and I mean, you use both. You know, today you use both to create what you feel is your expression, because it's all an art, you know, and at the end of the day, whether it's commercial, underground, which I hate those titles, and I, I get asked those questions all the time, commercial only means that there are more people hearing it than less. So, as far as I'm concerned, commercial is a good thing, because I want people to hear my music and understand what I'm doing. You know, I've, I've had that fight with a lot of people for a long time, but to sum this whole thing up, electronic music is where I started, you know, I mean, I started from a, or an acoustic thing, but I mean, my career in this business started with electronic music, and we're talking 20 plus years, 
So if anything, it's growing, it's getting better. We're having people like you, you know, that can come and witness the beginnings. And again, the history is very important because you have to know, you know, where you've been in order to figure out where you're going. So to sum it all up, just keep doing what you're doing and be true to yourself. I come from the day when um, uh, synthesizers were a threat and the uh, musicians' unions were trying to ban them because they were going to put musicians out of business, whole string sections and horns. And it was pretty it was for real. And they were like, you do synthesizers? You're one of those guys that are putting me out of business. The guys that didn't adapt were the guys that fell by the wayside. And the guys that did the synthesizers were laying down the string lines and the horn lines because that's how I started doing sessions and stuff like that. I have an iPhone. I got a beatbox on here. I could sit here and I could play beats and lay down little bass lines that are in my head. I come from the electronic side of electronic music, and it's better now than it's ever been. You're going to have a little device, it's in your pocket, you want to hack it, which I did on this phone, put some software on here, and you're ready to go. So you don't have to wait till you're home in front of your computer. The creativity is out there. You have so many choices. If you're stuck, you get online, you Google something, you find out something. We're here. Talk to us. Talk to other people online. It's, it's, it's only going to get better.